Chinese Air Forces today boast the second biggest air fleet in the world, after the US one. And just as other branches of the Chinese military, they've been modernizing at an astounding pace for basically 20 years now. So what do the Chinese fly with these days? What weapons do they use? How do they train and what issues do they have? Are they a world-class air force, a fierce dragon or a baby tiger? Aerial warfare is largely about strategy and force supremacy. It was like that since the advent of fighters in World War I. And in Supremacy 1914, a game which is sponsoring this video, you can choose a real country and lead it through World War I. It's a free online PvP strategy, where you can fight up to 500 other players in real time as you try to conquer their countries. This was World War I which really ushered the modern technology into warfare. I do sometimes like the change of pace and setting. The pace itself is slow and strategic and games can take weeks to complete. Binka viewers will get an exclusive gift by clicking on the link in the description. 15,000 gold and one month of premium subscription for free. Now let's go back to the present. For a long time, Chinese air forces, in which we include their naval aviation, were relegated to a purely defensive role intercept enemies and let the ground army do its work. But as the Chinese interests grew outside its borders, so did the mission sets of its air fleets. Today Chinese air forces could be summed up within several tiers. Bottom tier would be their second line fighters, J7s which are basically MiG-21 variants, and J8 fighters which are indigenous twin engine designs. They're basically 1960s designs with newer avionics. There are likely around 270 J7 airframes left, give or take some. But they're quite obsolete, very limited reach, almost useless radar, no beyond visual range weaponry and no guided air to ground weaponry. Their role can be boiled down to point defenders, possibly intercepting small enemy groups or bombers. A next up is the endangered species, the J8 fighter. There are only some 50 or so of those left. But there is a similar number of dedicated recon airframes as well, which retained most combat ability for self-protection. Most of those J-8s are still fairly new, made in the 2000s and some of the recon planes are just 10 years old. The fighters were modernized with half a decent radar that can use fairly modern PL-12 missiles, which are roughly similar to early US AMRA models. Still, with little fuel and just two such missiles, J-8s are perhaps best used as force additions to other newer fighters, to harass the enemy from afar. The J-H-7 is also an old domestic design, stemming from the 1970s design school. But the type reached active service only in the mid-1990s. They're really strike planes, not fighters. Due to their size and not-so-demanding role of a standoff missile truck, they're quite useful even today. The production ended a decade ago. The plane is mildly supersonic with allegedly half-decent range and payload. Some JH-7s have been observed carrying several large jamming and ESM pods, suggesting they're a stopgap platform until a dedicated jammer arrives. The J-10 family went into service by the mid-2000s. It comes in four main variants. The A variant was produced by the mid-2010s, it's an F-16-sized fighter roughly comparable to 1990s F-16s when it comes to air-to-air -air combat. It's lacking in multi-role capabilities as it can only use laser-guided bombs for precision ground attacks. The S-variant trainer is still produced alongside the newer variants. The B-variant was a thorough redesign of the plane, though it seems its avionics were not up to standard as it was replaced by the C-variant fairly quickly. The C variant may soon overtake even the original variant. With its modern sensors and weapons, it is somewhat superior to the current US F-16s when it comes to air combat. Its air-to-ground weapon options are still not quite on par with the F-16 though. The flanker family is the mainstay of Chinese air forces. It features fighters, conversion trainers, multi-role variants and carrier-borne planes. Today China is the biggest flanker user in the world. Su-30 multi-role flankers have been partially modernized with some Chinese sensors. They now use Chinese missiles. J-11s are pure fighter variants, basically Su-27s, though they've since been modernized like the Su-30s. 
the B variant is completely made in China and the majority of those planes are not older than 10 years. It's roughly comparable to the US F-15C without the newest radars. J-15s are similar to the J-11B in capability, but they're multi-role, being able to use air-to-ground weapons as well, and they're carrier-borne fighters. Su-35s are advanced multi-role fighters. China signed a no-follow-up contract with Russia, though. The J-16 is China's most potent flanker, a multi-role plane carrying the widest range of Chinese air-to-air -air and air-to-ground weapons. It sports a new radar and should, in general, be comparable to the US newest F-15EX fighters. Even though J-16s are multi-role and they've even been observed with anti-ship missiles, almost all were delivered to units that originally trained with pure fighter planes. So there may still be a focus on air superiority within the Chinese Air Force, despite the fact the overall hardware is increasingly becoming multi-role capable. China's newest and most capable plane is of course the stealthy J-20. Right now it's likely only an air superiority fighter, but strike mission capabilities may be added as its fleet grows in numbers. If you're wondering just how capable it is, we can suggest you watch our J-20 vs F-35 video. While capable, its numbers are low and it will take some years until that changes. Then there is the only Chinese bomber, the H-6. Originally a licensed copy of the old Soviet Tupolev-16, it has since gotten a new lease on life with brand new variants. The K variant signaled a major redesign with new materials, new engines and likely significant improvements in range and payload, critical for a missile delivery truck. Various other sub-variants have appeared since then. The H-6 is now used as a carpet bomber, in a refueling tanker, cruise missile carrier, ballistic missile carrier, anti-ship missile platform, a stratospheric recon drone carrier, and some of the H-6s received in-flight refueling probes themselves. The anti-ship missile carrier role for the Air Force H-6Ks is significant in so much as it continues the recent trend in the Chinese Air Force, where more and more of the Air Force planes are seen training with anti-ship missiles unlike years ago, when only naval planes used those. In recent years, the Air Force's JH-7, J-16s and J-10s have also been seen carrying anti-ship missiles. While only some of those would likely actually perform such missions, the trend is one of rapid expansion of Chinese aerial anti-ship platforms. The emphasis on the anti-shipping role is perhaps also visible in the overall weapon inventory. Right now, three different aerial anti-ship missile types are used by the air fleet. On the other hand, there is a visible lack of choice to the tactical guided air-to-ground weapons. Certain mission types may not even be well covered. The two most prominent guided weapon types seem to be laser-guided bombs and medium-sized cruise missiles. In recent years, there have also been some sightings of an unpowered glide bomb somewhat similar to the US JSOW bomb. Due to its range, such a bomb would most likely have to use satellite guidance. But curiously, even though Chinese manufacturers do offer such guidance for weapons made for export, there has been no proof yet that Chinese Air Force uses such weapons. It is possible that some of the laser-guided bombs have a secondary satellite guidance method, as most of the modern LGBs in the West do nowadays. But as for most basic just satellite-guided bombs, akin to the US JDAM, China doesn't seem to be using those. Some small-form LGBs have only been recently observed, but those lack range and guidance options of the similarly small US SDB family. Small tactical missiles in the Maverick class are not used by China either, if one discounts a small number of Russian-procured missiles for their Su-30s back in the early 2000s. It could be that the Chinese don't fully trust their ability to control the airspace near a frontline and don't think they could effectively use such weapons, or maybe their targeting systems are not yet up to snuff. Or they believe their laser-guided or dual-guided bombs are enough for pretty much all short-range attacks. Where China does not seem to be behind is its air-to-air -air missile inventory. The PL-15 is slowly replacing the PL-12. It has been observed on all the new Chinese planes. It likely has new electronics and a new rocket motor. Its size may mean its seeker can hold its own against the latest AMRAMs. Range-wise, the worried quotes of US Air Force officials in recent years leave little doubt that it outranges even the latest AMRAMs. 
The PL-10 is the Chinese next-generation short-range missile. Its aerodynamic layout is close to the European Iris-T, though it's a bit larger. With its large imaging infrared seeker and vectored thrust, it's likely at least as capable as the early Sidewinder X variant. Then there is the big mystery missile observed since 2016. It seems to be too large for anything but flankers. The US has no air-to-air -air missile in such a class, but the appearance of the Chinese missile may have spurred the development of such a weapon. Older Chinese missiles could also still be dangerous. Not just the PL-12, but the PL-8 family, which was originally a licensed Israeli Python 3 missile, but has since gotten a new dual-color seeker. Overall, Chinese missiles are likely quite capable and dangerous, though their achievements have partly been attained through larger size, which results in somewhat fewer missiles carried than their US counterparts. Chinese air forces overall still do have issues. Since they're expanding in numbers and since their starting base involved planes designed in the 1950s, they've got a very wide mix of planes, both stealth fighters and near obsolete MiG-21 derivatives. Even when the latter get retired in 3-4 to four years time, China will still have hundreds of early 3rd and even some early 4th generation planes to replace or modernize. Unless Chinese fighter procurement drastically increases overnight, or unless its fleet shrinks or stagnates, all of which is unlikely, it may take until the early 2030s for Chinese air forces to have a fleet made up of exclusively modern 4th gen and 5th gen fighters. Chinese fighters are also a bit more range limited than their US counterparts, like the F-16s or F-15s for example. Also despite the fact China is pumping a lot of money into its military, its air forces are still a regional power. China has a single overseas military base. It has a few bases in the South China Sea, somewhat extending its reach. But all those do not allow China to significantly extend the reach of its air forces. The other leg of the power projection is an in-air refueling fleet. China has a token capability there. Even adjusted to the size of its combat fleet, the capability comes nowhere near that of the US, for example. The light at the end of the tunnel is their Y-20 tanker, a variant of their domestic transport plane. Its production has been ramping up since 2016 and it's plausible China will be adding several tankers per year now. The power projection issue is lacking when it comes to supplying its ground forces as well, via airlift, for all the same reasons. Again, domestic models such as Y-20 and the Hercules analogs Y-8 and Y-9 are slowly alleviating that issue, but it will take a decade or more to build up a proper airlift fleet. Where China is focusing more is in special mission aircraft, AWACS, electronic emissions gathering and so on. Its Y-8 and Y-9 platforms seem to be especially useful to China as the basis for all those electronic surveillance or jamming planes. Their fleet is approaching the US Air Force One in numbers in certain areas. China has some big jammer platforms, while the US has long retired theirs and now focuses on tactical jammers like the Growler. Chinese tactical jammer platforms are hard to assess. Some of their JH-7s have been used as such, and the dedicated jammer flanker variant is about to enter service. More and more Chinese planes have been observed with tactical jammer pods for self-protection. Though overall, China still seems to be behind the US in number of planes with integrated jammers and growler-like jamming platforms. Finally, what's sheer hardware without training? Exact proficiency of Chinese pilots is unknown, but the following is known. In the last 20 years, the Chinese have increased the number and size of their training and tactics development bases a few times over. Various aggressor units have formed and large-scale exercises numbering 100 combat aircraft at the time have been performed in recent years. The Chinese main primary trainer aircraft is still the JL-8, and there are still many JJ-7 lead-in trainers, but those are gradually getting replaced by the new JL-10. Initial training hours are similar to the US Air Force syllabus. As for flight hours of graduated pilots themselves, there are very little figures out there. While there have been instances of elite Chinese pilots reaching 200 flight hours per year, reported in the Chinese media, it's likely that the average fighter pilot hours for maintaining proficiency don't go as high. Some unconfirmed source allege an average of just 120 hours per year. Those figures could be out of date. 
Truth to be told, US Air Force flight towers have been dipping for a decade now and aren't necessarily much better, depending on the source. But what Chinese Air Force pilots are surely missing is operational experience, actually getting a chance to do combat missions around the world, even if those are against less than peer opponents. Various large drones are another area where the Chinese Air Force has made great strides at modernizing. After the US, the Chinese drone fleet is probably the second largest and most capable. The Chinese WZ-7 is a pretty unique design and likely mimics the mission of the US Global Hawk drone, though it is half its size. The WZ-8 is a special drone launched from a bomber. It likely uses its rocket motors to go quite high up, then glides down at above Mach 3 as it does recon work. Chinese high-tech planes will likely continue to trickle in the coming years. Their H-20 bomber is expected to be something like the USB-2, both in size and capabilities, and may be unveiled in the coming year or two. But the future composition of the Chinese Air Forces was already covered in one of our recent videos, so check that out. Whatever the near future might bring will likely only partially alleviate the core issues of the Chinese Air Forces, geography and bases, which confine its work area to a somewhat limited playground in Asia. The bases also suggest the fleet is still defensive in nature. Most of their planes are dispersed around a large number of bases. China uses fewer planes per base than the US Air Force, and various storage complexes within mountain tunnels are quite common. While dispersal and hardening makes the Air Force harder to be destroyed on the ground, it also makes it harder for China to amass large concentrations of Air Force quickly. The issue of being confined geographically may not be solved even with additional tanker aircraft, as long as there are potential adversaries' bases nearby. Then again, China has done a lot to protect its immediate surroundings. US Air Force officials said so themselves. Should US forces be worried then? If their goal is to operate closer than a thousand miles away from China, yes. But even at 700 miles away or more, Chinese air attacks would lack in numbers and persistence to threaten US bases, if the latter could find enough bases for a thousand planes nearby. But trying to control the airspace over East and South China Sea, let alone the Chinese coast, might already be mission impossible for the US. Overall, everything shown so far suggests the role of the Chinese air forces is still seemingly confined to one of a defensive force a force to intercept enemy air forces and naval forces working near China, and a force that will still need some years, if not a decade, to be able to truly lay down fire and brimstone on a major scale to its overseas adversaries. Before we go, a few more words on World War I strategy gaming experience. I know of no other game which lets you conquer Europe and world from 1914 onwards. A smaller Europe map for 31 players is great for the condensed experience, but it's the 500 player world map that's really a true simulation. Different terrain will affect your movement, the units will move in real time on historical maps, a unit and building art is historically accurate, and there's a massive technology tree with more than 120 different units, including secret weapons of World War I to research. The game can be played on PC and mobile with the same account. And as said, if you click on the link below, you will get 15,000 gold and one month of premium subscription for free. So choose your country and go dominate World War I. And remember, Binkov may talk about hypothetical wars, but only real peace can bring us all together.